Bom dia a todos e a todas que nos assistem. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are here to open a debate session to address governance internet challenges. This is the second meeting of the International Governance Internet Governance Forum. We would like to thank our speakers, Laura Denartis and Marília Maciel. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And our moderator, Fernanda Rosa, who is a postdoc researcher at Enborg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's affiliated at the Center of Global Communication Research. She's got a feminist approach in the infrastructure of internet interconnection. She's a member founder of uh, Internet Governance in Brazil, and she's associated to the American University Internet Lab. She's the co-author of the book Learning Mobile Learning in Brazil. Thank you, Fernanda, for accepting accepting our invitation. Now I hand over to you so we can open this debate and this event is being transmitted into English and Portuguese at nick.br YouTube channel connections. It's a great honor and have a wonderful debate. Thank you, Luisa. Can you all hear me all right? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those of you who are in a different time zone. I am so glad and honored to be participating at the Internet Governance, Internet International Internet Governance Forum with two distinguished guests. Let me remind you about the this terrible time that we are all going through in Brazil. We have over 3,000 deaths daily. So please, a minute of silence for this terrible fact. So one minute, please, of silence. Thank you. So I'm uh, happy to be here. As I said, I'd like to thank the School of Brazilian Internet Governance. And I feel so honored to be the moderator of this panel. Marília Maciel and Laura Denards, who I will fully introduce to you in a while. I was graduated in the EGI school in the 2016 group, and I also carried out a number of researches at NICBR São Paulo headquarters and also in Salvador Bahia. Uh, that was so important in my academic uh, achievement, which helps me to understand the role of internet governance in the globe. Any time that people tell me, well, I didn't know about that, I always recall those 
uh, pioneer moments that I learned with uh, Nick CGI, EGI, and this great uh, internet Brazilian ecosystems that we have uh, thanks to small and large internet providers, academia, and a number of uh, knowledge, different uh, knowledge sources. But today I'm here wearing the Pennsylvania University hat. I am in Philadelphia. It's nine uh, uh, o'clock in the morning. And I hope that we Brazilians take the best of the academia. And I'm here to moderate this workshop, which will count on a brief introduction, followed by our speaker's talk, followed by one hour debate with some Q&A and our attendees' contribution. So all of you who are following us in the YouTube, you are all invited to submit your questions via the chat so they can be addressed. Your questions may be addressed in the three languages, Portuguese, English, and Spanish. And in case not all questions will be able to be answered, I guarantee that I will read all of them because I'm extremely interested in learning more about this matter. So our goal to today is to address two main questions. First, what is internet governance? This is a quite broad and challenging question. And the goal is to understand what was governance internet in the past and how is that designed into the present and to the future considering all challenges. Last Thursday, we had a presentation which raised the issue as how internet governance is so restricted to experts in an area of knowledge that finds difficult to multiply in the society. I believe that today's workshop can show an alternative vision to that as one of the main challenges today is that internet governance goes beyond those multi-stakeholder settings. That is, there are many more people performing internet governance than those of us that also that self-describe ourselves as being internet governance advocators. And that leads us to participation and a much greater diversity of multi-stakeholder areas and those not multi-stakeholder players, but that have a key role in the public interest realm. With that, I would like to make a brief introduction as we have two experts that will allow us to consider internet governance from a much broader perspective. And with that, we'll be able to have a comparative analysis regarding global internet governance and Brazilian internet governance. Briefly, I would like to point out to Brazilian internet governance, where we are in Brazil and in this broader governance context. There are three issues. First, governance in democracy. Second, economic concentration for content providers and how will that affect democracy and internet governance. And third, the meaning of participation within 21st century. I just loved the debate of uh, the debate of uh, pioneers, internet pioneers in Brazil, when the word uh, governance was not fully understood in the beginning of the 90s, when CGI was being created. And that's interesting because the term governance is related to the World Bank and that is related to democracy. The, the, the term governance within the public policies is an answer, an answer to a vision related to authoritarian government, governments was not enough for a full 
governance. Brazil has just stepped out a dictation in the beginning of the 90s. Governance is a broad concept. But to this matter today, governance is not a sum of governors, but rather the idea of a number of sectors participating to the society within the public policies. The, the Brazilian policy by the end of the dictation and the creation of a new constitution, the constitution of 1988, is permitted by that new constitution of 1994. And in 1995, we have a historic change in the federal government uh, stating that the state could be guided by results, one, decentralization, two, and three, inverted commas, a higher participation of the society within the public policies. However, CGI is a consequence of a well-succeeded actions of pioneers in the Brazilian internet and this broader political context of telecom privatizations, which defines internet as a service of added value as long as the as long as countries such as US and Mexico creating that uh, necessary regula regulatory environment and today we have over 7000 small providers in the country as a consequence of that during 2001 elections, CGI goes through some reforms which enhances such a participation. And today, 2021, what I would like to say is that the Brazilian democratic context is so different and there are several initiatives of internet governance which do not go throughout those multi-stakeholder scenarios such as the digital governance politics policies, I should say. There is a decree which suggests public future services. And such a decree suggests to implement resources of artificial intelligence and a minimum of 12 federal public services by 2020. Such a way of saying where you place the technology before results, before public interests, this should be considered and thought over. In addition, public policies managed by decrees, they are not good to include social participations. And that international seminar, which I participated last Friday, addressed the decision process of multi-stakeholder process, which those who didn't have a chance to participate, you should. Instead of going after vote, we should try to reach a common denominator, which is the essence of politics and takes longer to become a reality. But it's more stable, and that's exactly the trade-off. That's why we prefer to be like that. Power concentration. Technology companies, they also perform internet governance based on internal decisions, based on commercial interests and outside the public scrutiny. And they are discussed broadly in the society as we have issues such as fake news, personal data exploitation, third restriction of uh, freedom of expression. Which democracy should I ask for? Which democracy are we mediating throughout those digital platforms? In the US, they are known as big tech, in Europe as GAF, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. And today, 
We have Marilia and Laura with us, and we'll be able to understand the role of those platforms with a global guidance. And that's not only what type of democracy are we building up, but which internet infrastructure are we building up, which concentrates the economic power as they will impact the information internet flow. And to conclude, I hope that our workshop will address participation in 2021. That participation of the year, uh, the year 90s, where we saw governance emergency, CGI emergency, which is not the same expectation that we have nowadays. Social advancements, they lead to deeper discussions of gender, race, ethnicity, city to analyze the CGI participation where just 14% of their members are women. This is striking and such a representativity is not distributed commonly that is concentrated over the third sector and academia. And to make that even more complex, genders today is not summarized within genders. There is all that queer aspect LGBTQ plus acronym helps us to understand the complexity and this panel is able to discuss about that and talk about, about representation today it uh, helps us to understand intersectionality which we are not just talking about sectors or intersector or a multi-stakeholder intersector ship but maybe we should talk about an intersectional multi-stakeholder approach in a committee where we have mainly men, we should ask, are there black men? This is what the intersectionality would include. Are there transgenders being represented? Are there black women being represented? The tragic death of uh, 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 Mariela Franco was led to that. So this is exactly the time that we are living today. This is what we have to discuss once we talk about participation. And as to ethnic and that has been a personal pleasure to me to share internet forum space with indigenous people. But the question today is which ethnic are we able to bring to the forums? I don't know if you heard about the Auto Shingu ethnic with the local leadership, they were able to capture funds to build up their own structure against the pandemics and they managed not to have one single death in their community. So to consider multi-stakeholder today is to consider diversity and inclusion of those voices which are underrepresented and how to make those voices being considered and let's not fool ourselves despite those voices are not being the multi-stakeholder spaces, they are is still performing internet governance and we may discuss upon that during the debate. Simultaneously, we have a number of biographies being created, but they do not mention that has been internet governance. In Brazil, we have a book, uh, we have a number of books that, that were organized by Tarcísio Silva, or in the US, a black soft book by Charlie Tomacuan, which also exemplifies such a matter. In the third sector uh, uh, space, a code writer also does it. Do they say what they are doing? Do they say that they are performing internet governance? With that in mind, I would like to open our workshop and to invite our next distinguished guests to talk. I would like now to introduce them in alphabetic order. Marília Maciel is a senior researcher. She's involved at several internet governance projects, electronic uh, commerce, cybernetic uh, issues. She was an advisor in GNSO, NAMUS at ICON, and she represented a number of groups. And she's a former member of the task force group of 
for internet improvement coordinated by the UN Science Committee. Marilia, she's also part of the academia and she's carrying out her PhD. Laura Denard, she is a professor. <laughs> She's an interim professor. She's a dean at the American University Communication School at Washington, D.C. She's a director of the Internet Governance Law Lab at the American University. And she's an author of seven books and the Internet Freedom Security book with no off switch, which was published by the EAO University Press back in 2020. And she and that was she was also listed as the best technology books awarded as one of the best technology books in 2020. She's got a background in information sciences uh, expertise and she's got a PhD in the same area. She's got over over two decades of expertise, and she's also uh, advisor and consultant in internet governance by the Fortune 500 foundation companies, governmental agencies as well. So next, I would like to invite Marília Maciel to address her talk. Welcome, Marília, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Obrigada, Fernanda. Thank you very much, CGIBR, for the invitation to be here. I would like to thank on uh, Diplo Foundation. It's wonderful to be here to participate with you. Thank you very much for your introduction, a very broad introduction. And it's great to be here with Professor Laura Donardis, someone who has served as an inspiration for many of my works in the academia. And it's wonderful to be here with all all of you, uh, the participants, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing your comments and questions. This is a very complicated uh, moment to all of us, especially to Brazilians, of course. But a discussion such as this tends to be relevant throughout the history, but especially in a situation like that, when we have to be fully focused, productive, but also very very resilient to be able to face all the battles that we are currently facing and will have to face in the future once the pandemic will be gone. We will inevitably have to reconstruct a number of things once the crisis is finally over. I just have some uh, few slides to share with you, but I would like to uh, first tell you what Internet governance is, what are the main uh, features, and what are the key challenges to multi-stakeholder model uh, currently face, especially the challenges that impact participation. A very good place to start is to discuss what internet governance is. What does it mean? And Fernanda just had the theoretical introduction about all the different lines that try to understand what governance is. But if we focus on governance and internet governance specifically, we have to understand that governance in Portuguese is something that is currently discussed a lot in the internet, thanks to the initiatives of uh, CGI.br. But in other countries, uh, it's not necessarily fully understood. And uh, it tends to be uh, mixed up with government, so governance and government. But governance is something broader than the government. It does include the government, but it's not limited to it. Governance involves the participation of a broader number of players interested in the topic. And uh, we also have uh, 
their right to participate, not because they are an official or an authority, but rather because they are legitimate. They are players that can really bring to the discussion something interesting and uh, enriching. It's a practical discussion about resources, about inputs to get to the best result, much more than having the formal authority of uh, any um, entity. The idea is always to get to a, a consensus, to a, a common understanding, getting to a rough consensus of all players. And each one has a role to play, has part of the puzzle, so to speak. And if we finally complete the puzzle, we can get to a harmonious governance model where decisions are in compliance with the challenges that we all have to face. When all players get together to discuss it, what are the main points for discussion? There are some key words in the definition of governance. So we should discuss guiding principles, what really guide the action of all players, what are the laws that are going to be enacted, what are the rules and the norms of conduct, what are the decision-making processes, institutions involved in the process, and finally, what are the specific actors or players that are part of this discussion. Focused on the so-called players, we call it the multi-stakeholder model. And each governance uh, will, uh, each governance item will have a number of uh, key players. Concerning internet governance, we have identified some of these players as being essential. And the list of players is just for illustration uh, process, because on a daily practice, we end up coming across different players which might be impacted or have something to include uh, in the process of governance. It is just a, an example. What are the uh, players we have together? So, uh, government, civil society, technical community, academia, business, and international organizations. And we can really uh, expand that and really understand in detail. So, for example, government, which areas of the government? The, the government is a fully complex entity and sometimes part of the government is in favor of another thing, the other part advocates for something else, and different ministries of government should be involved. For example, foreign trade, uh, foreign affairs, communication, telecom, and so on and so forth. And we should always identify for each specific question to be addressed, which are the key players within each of this broader category, for example, of government. The same applies to the civil society. Different players will have a, a very important role in the discussion, and so on and so forth. In a nutshell, we are talking about a collaborative responsibility. All of us, all of the actors that really contribute for internet to work uh, seamlessly so that all our needs are met. The second word of uh, internet governance is internet. If we speak to uh, anyone in the new generation, internet is ubiquitous. It's for them, it's the same as what power in the outlets, right? It's something intuitive to them. But if we go back to the timeline of internet development, we get to a point in which uh, we can realize that internet development was very organic. It was not created overnight. It was developed throughout the years. Uh, things came into play. For example, in 1995, Amazon was already in operation. Yahoo was in operation. Google came somewhat later in 1998. And the government started to participate formally 
about internet governance only in the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003 and 2005. When the government came into discussing the issue, the internet had already existed. It had been explored commercially and there were rules already. The players which were using internet commercially, they had already created, uh, they had already been using and had created their common understanding. So when the different governments came to discuss it during the World Summit, they also had to respect what had already been established and it been put in place. So it really helps us understand why it's something private-led. It's something that had been guided by the private entity and not the public sector. It is something, however, that had been changing uh, throughout the years and a point that I would like to make in my presentation here. But we can, of, of course, try to understand the internet through different layers. There is the basic layer of infrastructure, which makes internet run. So optic fiber cables, satellite, the telecom infrastructure per se. On top of that, we have the transportation, transmission, which determines the technical standards that make computers, machines, and routers, and all devices connected to internet can finally interact. And on top of that, we have the layer of content and apps, the one that is closer to us on a daily basis, where we can find all different content, services, and everything. When we analyze that, we have a very clear point uh, concerning internet governance, because for some time there was a discussion between discussing, uh, a discussion which was internet governance applicable only to technical standards, to managing the technical role of the network and a broader approach, which understand internet governance, which encompass technology, network, and all services that we access on the internet. So governance of internet and on the internet. So internet and the services provided by or, or access through internet. So we have a broader understanding of what internet is. Of course, it was a very good understanding because there are many public policies that can be encompassed by internet governance. But there is also an open-end category. So future topics may or may not be encompassed by internet. And uh, what are going to be the criteria to determine whether this topic can or cannot be included in the discussion? And this is something that we've been noticing for emerging technologies. As a result of uh, regulatory pressure, uh, because of privacy issues, because of uh, taxes over digital services, because of regulation of platforms, all the regulatory pressure has taken us to a situation in which processes and institutions had to be created for internet governance to be created. Uh, we can have a metaphor of a restaurant. So the different uh, players, so government, civil society, business, uh, we, we are customers in a restaurant and we are defining the menu of public issues we are going to face. And each of the problems can be addressed by some international organizations. Is it a domain name? Let's go to ICOM. Is it something related to a telecom? Maybe ITU can deal with that. Is it something related to standards? Probably this is going to be taken to Internet Engineering Task Force. Is it something related to trade? So, WTO. Therefore, throughout the decades, this is how Internet governance has evolved. 
identifying a number of international organizations that would be ultimately responsible for coordinating specific parts of internet governance according to their own mission and a broader entity was created to coordinate all these multi-stakeholder parties, which is the Internet Governance Forum, IGF. It's something that we are all quite familiar with in Brazil. We once, uh, we hosted it twice in Brazil. And the IHF really uh, puts into practice uh, this very open discussion in a horizontal fashion where everyone has uh, a voice and we can come to a, a common discussion. The IGF has produced some very important legacy beyond the forum and this moment of uh, sharing. And in my opinion, the main legacy is how it, the IGF has encouraged multi-stakeholder model to be embraced in different regions of the world. IGF has become a model of uh, uh, organization adopted by different countries. They created the regional and national internet governance forums. Therefore, having a chance to discuss all this governance of internet in a more participatory fashion. Countries which did not use to have this open discussion were inspired by IGF model. And uh, I was in Lebanon in the first year where players could put together a local internet governance forum. And it was really interesting, especially in a society which is not very used to having a participatory discussion. But it is possible to create a very practical forum of discussion like that. So I think IGF has served as an inspiration for these uh, regional forums to discuss a, this broader topics. Some Brazilian successful initiatives, such as the multi-stakeholder experience in Brazil, has also served to uh, fuel this discussion. CGI is an example. Also, the legal framework of internet discussed in Brazil, also a great role model. And we have uh, given even a better example during the NAT world, when all the different uh, mode, all the different players got together during a moment of uncertainty of which was the best way to take to deal with the problems we were facing, and that world given gave us a global multi-stakeholder meet, meeting to discuss internet surveillance in a very constructive way, involving all players impacted by the problems, producing finally a document, a very interesting document resulting from a multi-stakeholder discussion and internet discussion. A number of documents have already been published by different entities, but I would say that the final document of Net Mundial has or Network has been really interesting. Let me now talk about some challenges that we face in internet governance. First of all, a specialization of the topic. This is expected in any area of knowledge. When internet governance started being developed and internet per se was developed, the regulation of specific topics got more and more complex. For example, pri privacy today. This is something really complex. Or cybersecurity, there are different levels, national policy, national plans, different documents regulating cybersecurity. Therefore, specialization is expected. But all the players related with specific topics are getting narrower and narrower in their own niche. And something good about IGF was exactly break down with these niches and put all players to discuss together. 
And right now, we are, the movement is exactly the opposite. Those players that have some specific knowledge, they tend to work back in their niches. And I see that here in Europe. We have been observing that those uh, areas of internet governance uh, are no longer highly populated. Uh, the, the specialists have been allocated to specific areas, cybersecurity, privacy, infrastructure, and others. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying necessarily that this is something negative. It's something expected, I understand, as part of the process. But now we have to come up with new opportunities for all specialized players to keep on maintaining their discussion, their uh, areas of dialogue, so that we can avoid thematic fragmentation. And uh, then, of course, it would be much more difficult to discuss about internet as a whole. So why is still internet governance so important? And why shouldn't we simply put apart, uh, avoid putting apart this discussion? I think we have to understand internet governance as a forest, right? See the forest from the trees, right? We, of course, we can get a tree and see all its components and its function, but we are not going to understand the whole uh, forest unless we can see all the different trees together. And this is why I think that capacity building in internet governance gets even more importance, maybe more than what it was in the past. After going through a course of internet governance, which tends to be the entry-level training, players can go into specific topics, but having this full understanding of what internet governance is, is essential. And this helps us see the forest from the trees for the trees, I mean. Secondly, internet has become infrastructure. It's an infrastructure for development of a number of other technologies that are used and consider it as it's a given. Internet is a given. We are part of the so-called fourth industrial revolution in which we have a conversion of digital technology, biotechnology, and this process of uh, convergence poses a question to us. When are we going to define it's no longer part of internet governance? And a very clear example, in artificial intelligence. Very important topic. Is it under internet governance? Well, I'm not that sure. Artificial intelligence does not necessarily need internet to run. Of course, internet is important to different levels of data collection, transfer, the information will be in a data center for machine learning to happen. But is it a topic that should uh, really be addressed in a course of internet governance? I'm not that sure. And in Europe, what I've been observing is that organizations that have a very important role to play in internet governance, like privacy or and security, have had an allocation of resources uh, from their discussions and putting that into uh, really internet or artificial intelligence. And I think it does not make sense. I think we should allocate more resources to discuss topics such as security, uh, safety, and privacy rather than artificial intelligence. Of course, we have uh, internet governance and artificial intelligence governance and our challenge might be to work on these contact points, focus on the points of intersection between those different arrangements of governance. And within that conv convergence point is exactly where we have to in emphasize and enhance. Otherwise, we will have to address all the topics around that topic. And that's not exactly our role.
We have the foreign shifting concept. Uh, our bulk of uh, internet governance is totally full up of topics. After internet governance has been broadly defined, however, the water is being spread to other institutions, those that were not initially identified as those to discuss upon internet governance topics. And the foreign shifting definition is very clear within the commerce issues trade issues. In Europe, we have a number of topics which were classically discussed within the UN, which have been redesigned as trade topics by the OMS, WTO. And what is the WTO negotiations on e-commerce today? That uh, process that may lead to a trip that may lead to a specific clear rule which we all need to comply with that will lead with some topics such as data and how will that cross-border data flows, location of computer facilities and data, network neutrality, data protection, consumer protections, spam, cybersecurity, electronic authentication, electronic signatures, customs duties. I mean, the migration of that topic to a commercial agenda is quite clear. However, differently from uh, multi-stakeholder governance, uh, commerce or e-commerce areas, they are not uh, really transparent. So the WTO and what uh, the companies they are doing or negotiating, that is not published anywhere. We have no access to that uh, document. There is no transparency to other players' participations. Therefore, non-governmental intervention that is so small, so little. I had a chance to talk about that topic in two different occasions, but that is a still a very small area. That may lead to specific areas of classic areas of governance, of internet governance that may be approved without technical or civil society participation. Neither all those essential players for internet governance. And that is, and how is that taking place? Well, let's try to cover that during the Q&A session. There is another challenge to internet governance, which is fragmentation. There is a dispute to digital and technological homogeneity, and many countries they are in that dispute. Falada na mídia e por atores da academia. How is that dispute being addressed in the media? That is being uh, seen as a Cold War dispute. And some countries, they have to align on one side or another for that hegemony. China growth uh, based on the uh, Occidental perspective as China is, be, is seen as a threat, as China does not share the same values. What is being gaining too much space in our debates is a technology alliance between 10 or 12 countries which are like mind, those who share same values, and those countries they would discuss upon some important topics such as technolo international technology development, artificial intelligence, data flow, data search within that perspective. 
And within those countries, there is no space for developing country. We know that those developing countries, they would be invited once developed countries would believe about its relevance, but that would be an, an alliance within developed countries only. At the same time, they suggest those governance models on the G7 groups. Those are the industrialized countries. And last week, they suggested to G7 to create a governance model to discuss upon three main topics, data flow, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. Once again, there is a suggestion for a new governance model, which goes around those traditional uh, drivers which were discussed in the beginning of this talk. And the last, but probably the most important challenge that internet governance faces nowadays is that after 30 years of uh, a statement that digital access would lead to prosperity for all, to the whole society, such a promise has been broken. In the beginning of this year, the Economic World Forum has published a report where they identify, according to their historical series, those main challenges to guarantee global stability, challenges that may lead to uh, imbalance in the democracy, economy and institutional matters. Within those challenges that are within the top 10 lists, we have power concentration within digital environment and inequality, digital inequality that are driven in that digital environment. So digital power concentration and digital inequality and many organizations, they are uh, pointing to that issue that has been published by the World Banks back in 2016. And ever since UNCTAD, Internet Society itself is highlighting this concentration process from internet infrastructure perspective at different layers, as well as an economic perspective and the democratization of digital economic benefits that has broken. And to uh, considering a future perspective, there is no governance regimen proposed that will be legitimate if that uh, is not the center of the matter. And one of the principles that is part of our govern internet governance agenda has to do with uh, economy, economic issues. We are very good in discussing about infrastructure, framework, that is part of all discussions, but economic issues, they are minimally present and they are not discussed in depth but for the in the for developing countries especially to brazil that should be a core discussion and i see that as a challenge as the framework and the terminology and vocabulary to a discussion that takes place in the WTO is a discussion for those uh, players who are not uh, used to that sort of discussion. And I believe that at the next discussion regarding who will benefit from digital technology or future internet are those that will just understand the economic value of data, not just from a superficial level, but to be able to understand in depth what what is the real value that can be extracted from that? What can we do to enhance the competition within digital economies? So I would rank those as being the main five challenges for future internet. There are many others that I believe my colleagues will still address. But in my opinion, these are the main ones that we should really pay attention and embrace in the coming years. With that, I conclude and I thank you for your time and attention. And now I give the floor back to our moderator, Fernanda Rosa. Thank you, Marilia. That was an amazing presentation, so uh, comprehensive. 
Next, I would like to invite Professor Laura Denardis, as Marilia said, has a very important role in the internet governance in the American, not only in the American academia, but in the world internet governance. And as her former student, it's a great honor to introduce her. Welcome, Laura. Well, hello, everyone. Let me just ask uh, Fernanda and others if you can hear me okay. Great. Well, hi, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Fernanda, for your introduction and for the work that you do. And it's really just an honor and a pleasure to uh, be joining and following the remarks of Marilia, which I enjoyed very much. I think what I can add to the discussion, uh, just uh, from the launching point of what Maria said, is to uh, ask the question of where is internet governance going? You know, what are some of the technological changes and also the political changes that are also changing internet governance? Um, now, uh, I just want to say, I love the analogy of internet governance being the forest. And um, I want to add that the internet itself is a substrate of everything in society, from the economy to the public sphere, to the media, to political life, to day-to-day -to -day functioning, especially during the pandemic that is keeping us apart today. We certainly understand this. But at the same time, many people lack basic access or meaningful access, and they're being left behind. So there is a tremendous, uh, serious digital inequality on a global scale. But whether someone is on or off the internet, they are still affected by what happens on the internet. For quite some time now, Conflicts over internet governance, which are often inside technology itself, are new spaces on the global stage where political and economic power is unfolding. And how these control struggles uh, play out, it, it just it, it affects so many issues of importance in society from uh, dealing with disinformation and threats to democracy, to individual speech rights, to privacy, uh, to discrimination, to consumer safety, and national security. It's very difficult to find any public policy issue around the world that is not affected somehow by questions about how the internet is governed. Now, one point I would like to make um, is that the internet is governed. It is governed, and that this governance takes place uh, outside of the discussions and the forums and the convenings that talk about internet governance. So while we are talking about <clears throat> internet governance in various forums, there still is a technical infrastructure. There still is um, a process of coordination of that infrastructure that has very real stakes to society. Now, um, I agree with uh, the definitions of internet governance that have already been um, put forth here, but I will add another one. Um, <clears throat> for the purposes of um, the infrastructure itself, the term internet governance generally refers to the design and the administration of the technologies that keep the internet operational, and then the enactment of public policy around that technology. Now, there is not um, another point I would like to add to our discussion today is that there's not one system, but an entire ecosystem of control points. This is the forest that Marilia talked about, uh, the internet governance forest. There's an entire ecosystem of control points and decisions that are carried out by the private sector, by new international organizations, by transnational activist networks in some cases, by technical coordinating bodies, and of course, governments and international agreements. Just wanna come back to the technology for a moment. There are many technological governance issues that are absolutely necessary 
to keep the internet operational, to stabilize the global digital system. And I thought I would just uh, mention what some of these are. There's the administration of critical internet resources, names and numbers, by a whole collection of organizations and entities, some which are international in their nature and some which are local. There's the establishment of technical protocols by standard setting institutions, such as the ones that were mentioned, the Internet Engineering Task Force, for example. There is interconnection coordination. There is cybersecurity governance, which is carried out by a combination of public and private institution. And of course, there's a lot of uh, policy making attention and media attention and really just public understanding now that private content intermediaries and infrastructure intermediaries, whether that is um, a social media company or a content distribution network or a financial intermediary, these have a tremendous policymaking role around uh, privacy, free speech, what content is allowed to stay online, what content gets taken down, and many other uh, governance areas. And across um, all of these areas, governments make laws about cybercrime, identity theft, defamation, privacy, the protection of children, trade, intellectual property, and a host of other er issue areas. So every single one of these areas that I mentioned has profound public policy implications, and um, especially the most technically concealed areas. So that is a really interesting feature of internet governance, that there actually are decisions made in um, you know, complex technologies that affect human rights and uh, human security. Think about encryption design, uh, for example, as one of these. So there's no one system <clears throat> of internet governance. So we can't debate the question of like, who controls the system because there is not one system. There are many, many different layers of control, each of which have um, tremendous public interest implications. What I'd like to do now is mention two shifts one technical and one political that are that are changing uh, to a certain extent the object of internet governance. The first, of course, is the Internet of Things. This is uh, the subject of my latest book, which is called The Internet in Everything. And the thesis of that book is that the internet is no longer a communication system connecting people and information. It is a control network in which more things than people are connected and in which control over that entire infrastructure is a proxy for political power. This is often called the Internet of Things, <clears throat> which includes home appliances, connected clothing, often called wearables. Uh, it includes the industrial Internet of Things. It includes smart cities. And it includes the internet of self, meaning that the internet is on and inside of the flesh through medical devices uh, like pacemakers, insulin pumps, <clears throat> and in some cases, even subdermal chips. So this is, the, this is the internet in everything. These are objects and systems that have both physical and cyber elements, as opposed to the screen-based internet we access through a phone, a laptop, and, and the way that we're communicating today. This is a major challenge to internet governance because the history of that whole realm has primarily addressed human communication, the communication around uh, content between people or human access to knowledge, financial systems, and other kinds of information. But if you think about the transformation of the internet moving from the screen-based world into the physical world, that means that the digital world and the physical world can no longer be viewed as distinct spheres. So when we use the term internet governance, it is vital to not only address human content and communications, these things are very important, such as disinformation, hate speech, uh, political propaganda, 
all of these things. Um, it's also, in, in fact, it, it's a very, very consequential issue that the internet is embedded directly into the physical world and that creates a new set or an enhanced set of public policy issues. As we have autonomous systems like driverless vehicles being used in industrial settings, as we increasingly have um, physical cyber objects that are taking over um, many different classes of employ employment, jobs are being challenged. This really will be a major transformation that may be even more consequential than the shift from agriculture, from an agricultural society to an industrial society. What will this mean for jobs that so much of the world is automated through the internet of things? Of course, privacy is completely transformed. The internet of things radically escalates privacy concerns, moving from everything we do through a screen, like a phone or a laptop, to everything we do in every aspect of our life, in bedrooms, in bathrooms, in houses, in workplaces, in your, your employment, in cars, in transportation systems, walking down the street. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really, really a shift. Privacy is completely transformed. And what I would like to suggest is that it makes privacy even more connected to some of the issues that Fernanda mentioned in her remarks, such as discrimination and such as social justice issues. So if you have uh, this kind of pervasive and uh, all-encompassing data collection, that, it, that can be used for discrimination in employment, in insurance, in, uh, it's used for uh, law enforcement purposes. And actually, if you speak with um, anyone who, who responds to domestic violence calls, if you speak to police officers, they already understand that the Internet of Things is now a way that domestic violence is perpetrated. So if someone is, wants to harass um, a partner and they've moved out of the house, they can turn lights on and off. They can um, use video systems that are inside of homes. They can change and lock and unlock the door through their smartphone. So this is, this is really a new terrain of uh, privacy of, and of human security that these systems are all around us in the physical world. Now, obviously, security is also transformed because a cybersecurity breach is no longer about losing access to communication, but about the ability to drive a car or access medical care. So, th so there are many other implications, um, you know, that I discuss in my new book. But uh, it affects the economy, democracy, disinformation. Think about the kind of disinformation that can happen over the Internet of Things, where you can have uh, fake weather reports, fake readings about climate change, you could have, um, it, it, it makes other kinds of disinformation look very easy to solve by comparison, because uh, it's embedded in the physical world. And once a sensor picks up on a false reading, encrypts it, legitimizes it, and um, it seems like it is true, but it may not be. So disinformation in the Internet of Things is something um, that I, I believe we'll see more of in the coming years. Now, what does this all mean? I, I want to discuss a little bit what this, what this does to challenge global norms in internet governance. So it does challenge a lot of what, uh, what internet governance has been. Uh, we can't look at internet governance as fixed, but think that technology can change. So internet governance is not fixed any more than technology is fixed. Um, as the internet leaps from uh, two-dimensional space into three-dimensional space, so does internet governance have to leap into that space as well. So um, one shift is that cyber policy, internet governance, it becomes entangled with other policy areas that have previously had, you know, not as many connections to internet governance. So consumer safety is obviously an area. 
um, because of the embedding of the uh, cyber technologies into the physical world, internet governance is also more closely related to environmental policy. So it touches every, it always has touched many public interest areas, but now it's no longer relegated to the digital information sphere only. It touches the natural world, it touches biology, it touches um, medical care, diagnostic devices, and human safety in a, in a variety of profound ways. So the internet um, entering the physical world also changes definitions of everything in internet governance. Fernanda mentioned companies like Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, or GoFam, add Microsoft to that. Now it's no longer possible to distinguish a tech company from a non-tech company. All firms are now technology companies. They all collect massive amounts of data about customers. They all require strong cybersecurity to continue functioning. And most companies' products and services now embed this internet capability. So they exist both in the digital world and the real world. And uh, firms like financial firms, even sporting manufacturers, retail companies, they do see themselves as technology firms. Um, that is a, that's a major shift. Another complication is what is an internet user when internet users are not necessarily people? Many connected objects like energy sensors have no formal relationship to human users. We already know that some people online are actually bots, which are uh, programs that simulate human activity. We know that. And we also know that many people who have never been online are still directly affected by what happens online, such as being um, affected by a data breach that happens in a store. Uh, like here in the United States, a, a store called Target had a data breach. And someone who's never been on the internet can be affected by that. Or they can be affected by a ransomware attack when they go to the doctor and they're unable to get medical care. So um, what, what this means is that phrases such as being on the internet or being off the internet, they don't have a distinct meaning anymore. That is a major complication. And <clears throat> of course, um, what is internet freedom in this environment? Um, internet freedom has often, it's, it's, a, it's a term that has many meanings. It has shifted a lot over the years, but it has always focused primarily on content and partic particularly issues around speech. And those, is those freedom issues have been prioritized to a certain extent over security. And that is not the case anymore. And now the right to, if I may uh, say something provocative, the right to not be killed over the internet through a medical device, through a car, or through a home system is a tremendous um, you know, human concern. So the internet is constantly shifting. The new kinds of implications of this are emerging at a rapid rate. And so must internet governance not be considered fixed. And uh, the final um, provocation that I would add here is that as the internet is entering the physical world, there are new actors and new institutions. So the institutions of internet governance that have always dominated, and in particular in technical standard setting, may not be the dominant institutions in this new setting. And this um, has profound implications. I would also like to, I, I promised that I would say something about a more of a political change. And uh, this is what I would suggest as a, an emerging issue, although it is one that has been rising for, for quite a long time. Uh, this is an issue of politics. It's an issue of private industry. And it is that infrastructure of the internet is now being co-opted. Infrastructure is being used to carry out goals that have nothing to do with the original design of the technology. Uh, this was a subject of a book that I co-edited with some of my colleagues called The Turn to Infrastructure in Internet Governance. 
And what it's about is um, that governments and private companies are using infrastructure to carry out some role that is powerful in the digital sphere. So one example of this uh, that's very current is the concern about China's proposal to re-engineer the internet protocol. So that's that's uh, an example of um, like co-opting infrastructure in some way. Um, a better example is how um, infrastructure providers such as web hosting companies cut off social media. Uh, a recent example of that in the United States was in the aftermath of our presidential election when Amazon Web Services cut off the social media company Parler because of the violent extremism that was on that site. Um, many other examples exist. Uh, they have for quite a long time, especially the use of the domain name system um, to, to censor or the use of the domain name system to um, mediate intellectual property rights enforcement. So it's just a reminder that as the whole world is focusing on content, as the whole world is focusing on social media platforms and their role in the world, uh, their 99% of the infrastructure of the internet is beneath that. And it is far more powerful to control. It's a, it's a far more powerful mechanism to control content. So even though architecture is distributed, even though um, there are many different actors and there's an entire forest or ecosystem of internet governance, there still really are choke points that are hidden levers of internet control. These are not uh, visible in the same way that content and social media is visible, but still very powerful. So we have the digital mediation of the public sphere, but we also have the privatization of the conditions of rights within that sphere. We have a constantly shifting technology moving the internet into the physical world. We have a new set of actors that are emerging in that world. And we have an increasing turn to infrastructure to enact various kinds of political and economic power. So as we do that, it is just a reminder that the internet is in everything. It is determining our freedom. It's determining our security and that we live in a world with no off switch. As these changes happen and as technology changes, we can't think of internet governance as fixed any more than we can think of technology as fixed. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and I will turn it back over to the moderator. Hum, thank you so much, Laura. Ah, muito obrigada. Foi uma apresentação. Thank you. It was breathtaking, really. I think it may serve as food for thought and also as inputs for future discussions that will uh, certainly uh, keep on happening shortly. I would like to remind all of those participants that they may send their questions in their own native language and questions are going to get to my panel. Uh, we are going to have to uh, noon Brazil's time to discuss. And I have one first question to ask you. So that we can uh, talk about the global south forces and the north global forces. In Marília's presentation, we've seen that uh, mentioned through, a, let's say, a so-called alliance. But I would like to hear from you, based on your own experience, how do you see the relation between developed and uh, under, uh, underdeveloping countries or global north and global south countries discussing infrastructure and also politically speaking? Marília, would you like to go first? Thank you, Fernanda. Well, 
I have the impression that all the institutions that are important for internet governance are still in place. Politically, some of these institutions got less important. For example, WTA, uh, World Trade Organization, is important uh, for the discussion of uh, some issues involving trade, for example. But at the same time, there is another ecosystem of internet governance coming into play. So when we create an alliance with developed and developing countries, we can move towards that. Throughout the years, the mechanisms that we used to have concerning internet governance have not delivered effective decision-making space. Internet Governance Forum is very important and it encourages discussion and it has really delivered what it promised. But there was no area where developed and developing countries could get together and discuss towards joint decision-making. And having no opportunities to make decisions like that has made countries to look for alternatives so that they could make their decisions. So it happened by uh, within international organizations such as WTO, and it's a, it's a concern in some uh, institutions which are not multi-stakeholder. In the past, we used uh, to bring topics such as uh, cyber security during an ITU meeting. Probably you remember that it was a collapse of a meeting because they said, well, we cannot talk about cyber security. But where should we discuss? In the multi-stakeholder or in a multilateral um, work group? So we have, where should we discuss? In a small group, multi-stakeholder group uh, created among governments of developed countries and the private sector, which seems to be even more concerning. So I think that throughout the years, we have moved to an, a, an internet governance which tends to be more fragmented than it was in the past. In addition to other spaces which are not very uh, visible, where lobby is made, the main companies that invest in lobby here in Brussels with European Community are technology company. And these are dialogues which are not open to everyone. And then final proposals come to the public. But no developing country has been involved. And it wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. <coughs> After Snowden's disclosure, all the leadership of developed countries was placed at check, and it has really opened space for countries such as Brazil to become leaders from a political and from a, uh, a legitimacy space. But countries such as India, for example, are just working on internet governance just at national level, whereas Brazil has lost its leadership role and now it's involved in other kinds of problems. So I think that it would be really uh, uh, good to bring together developed and developing countries uh, to discuss. Uh, it, the opportunity has been lost, but yes, we have to move uh, towards having that, what has been called a reinforced IGF. And uh, it's a positive proposal, at least. So we really have to pick up the lost time and include actors, such as mentioned by Laura, actors which have gained more and more importance in internet governance, because now physical and uh, internet barriers are gone. So we need more inclusive spaces to discuss internet governance among all the different players. Thank you, Marilla. Thank you, Marilla. Laura, would you like to jump in? Uh, certainly, I will. 
add something to this. The first point I would make is that it is really important to have international fora to discuss uh, internet governance, to discuss how the technology is changing, and to discuss the emerging challenges. So I think that there's a tremendous amount of value, and that is one way to bring the Global South and the Global North to get together, to have discussions. But I do want to um, emphasize that while these discussions take place, they are just discussions. And they don't have that much impact on the actual way that the internet is governed. So that is, um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that. Internet governance is what happens in practice while these discussions take place. So there, there's some um, soft influence, there's some um, you know, there, there's some impact, but I don't want to oversell that. I don't want to oversell the impact of the global discussions, but it still is um, very important. The second point I would make is that uh, the distinction between the global south and the global north is definitely not a neat one. Um, it's very difficult to have um, that kind of um, essentializing of um, you know, like two types of people in the world, the global north and the global south. Because as you know, uh, there are many um, co corporations and uh, individuals and groups in Brazil that have a tremendous amount of power that is more power than some people who might be um, like, like a minority somewhere in the European Union or the United States. That, you know, there just are different, it's just not that neat. And the, the, the addition to that is that whether or not one is in the global south or in the global north, the majority of the power in this area rests with the private sector. So I think that's the real question, is what is the role of the private sector in having influence in various regions and across the world, and um, how that balances out with uh, the power of, of governments. So if you look at some of the roles of the private sector, in some cases, they are advancing human rights. In other cases, they are, not, they are uh, working against human rights. Uh, but it's the same question with governments. Um, some governments are have a very, very bad record around human rights in the internet. Look at the control structures in China. Look at how the Indian government is constantly cutting off people. Look at what is happening around the world. Look at the surveillance systems in the United States and in Great Britain. So that's why I always say that the best outcome is to think about this as a balance of powers between civil society, governments, transnational activist networks, and uh, the private industry. So, um, so that it, that's the ecosystem. That is the forest. And it's very important to have that balance. And that brings me back to the discussions. And the discussions in international fora help contribute to that balance. And to that extent, they're useful. Well, that's perfect. I guess that we have to think upon political issues as this is part of our politics. And once we hear the non-emergency of some international forums, and that is related to our political time, and that is related to what Laura said uh, once she states that uh, technique and politics they are together that's why we state technical politics we also share the same thoughts in Brazil we have a number of authors addressing the same issue Laura also believes that some private players they have a very important role in that matter. And we have we lack of economic discussion within internet governance. And with that in mind, I am working together with an economist, Janice Roche. And 
this year we had the chance to present at the TPRC 48, which is an American conference, and we had the chance to perform economic analysis of internet infrastructure for those four tech large companies, GAF, Google, Amazon, Google, and Apple, four companies. GAF is the acronym. Some other tech companies, they can be added to that. There is an antitrust discussion in the U.S. upon those four companies. That's why we decided to include them. And the idea is, if we consider the interconnection points between those companies, and these are public information, there are some other information which we are not aware of because they do not disclose it, but as to the public information we have, we understand that their interconnection points, they are based on the global sphere. For instance, Apple has 92% of their interconnection points in the global area, Amazon, 92 to 42, Apple 73, and Google 82 percent. Yes, we do have a, a significant economic issue there where we have preponderant players participating within the content sphere and how will that impact our users? Global internet users, they have to look after that information. If Brazilian users, they want to upload an Apple app and Apple is not based within those 30 Brazilian apps that is not present in into the global area and then anyone can connect to a PTT somewhere else, uh, even in Europe. Just to connect uh, here some of the loosened dots, economic relations, they are connected to political relationship. And that relationship I make between South and North is to understand the global South and the relationship we have with the internet exchange, uh, exchange uh, point of traffic, IXP, PPT. We have another question. Let me see, I'm just searching for the questions. We have a number of them. Hello, Professor Laura, good morning. Transdisciplinary dialogue uh, communication, they are quite complex and intertwined. What would be the first step to define governance uh, management? I believe the person who asked the question wants to know how to do governance once we know that this is a inter- and transdisciplinary topic. How can we bring it together different players. Any take on that? Maybe Marília could start and then Laura next. First of all, capacity building, that's quite obvious. And uh, internet governance uh, capacity building is a way to give to those who haven't got a technical background background the ability to talk to those that have got expertise to understand what is the problem behind that. I have carried out two surveys to map what we have in terms of discussion and communication in the African continent and globally speaking. And we understood the importance of internet governance as an entrance point to a specialization for different professionals from different sectors to be able to get in touch and dialogue and discuss about technical issues and technical issues that the infrastructure has within political relevant topics. How can we get an expert that is specialized in privacy to be able to understand what are the implications to privacy based on some different levels of that instance? First of all, internet governance uh, capacity building, that is key. Secondly, we have uh, some uh, policy makers who are participating into some conventional treats, and we should have those uh, policy makers 
as part of that interdisciplinary matrix discussion where we can get their knowledge and benefit from that. With the Diplo Foundation, we can bring those diplomats who are in Geneva, and that is a discussion who has migrated to the World Commerce Organization, where we can go deep into some commercial topics, where we can fully understand the service commerce discussion, but they have no idea as how internet governance works, how we can work with uh, IXP, that the content traffics on data grammar, that they go through different jurisdictions until they reach their final point of traffic. And as an international negotiator, how am I going to negotiate a data flow? So we have to be where those providers are today and to influence the decision-making process in such a way not to guide them to go to the right or to the left, as this is not our role as Diplo Foundation, but to give it to those professionals the proper tools for help them to reach proper decisions. Electronic commerce, for instance, some countries, they want to close or to reach an agreement before the end of the year. And we need, we must have proper conditions to be able to reach public policies goals, but at the same time to respect internet infrastructure to avoid future implementation problems. So, to summarize, we have to interview right in the beginning, but let's not forget those who are already working into that topic and who must reach fast decisions. Laura, before you answer, as Marília has already addressed that question, we have a second one to you. A number of uh, attention needs and risks, they were highly addressed here. But the question is, what should not be changed? What sort of mechanisms and internet governance drivers should not be changed, should be kept? Thank you very much for that question. I first have to talk about the internet and what shouldn't change before talking about internet governance. I think that raising attention to some of the problems in the internet sphere and in the ecosystem of internet governance is actually so important because the internet is so important. We've never really understood that as much as we do now during the global pandemic. And you know, Brazil is being, you know, I, I'm so sorry, Brazil is being hit so hard by the pandemic. The United States has been hit so hard by the pandemic as well. And never before has the general public understood the tremendous role of the internet in holding us together, in allowing children to go to school, in allowing us to come together right now, in allowing uh, elderly who are isolated in their homes to have social connection allowing people to continue working, allowing telemedicine. So yes, there are many people who don't have access. Yes, there are concerns about security and privacy in this sphere, but it is uh, really accentuating how uh, many social benefits, economic benefits and political benefits there are having the internet during the pandemic. The second point I would make is that uh, much is going well in internet governance. Uh, even if you think about the Internet of Things transformation that I talked about, it is precisely because the Internet of Things is so important that we have to get the privacy and the security of it right. Uh, now, even though there have been a lot of problems um, in, the, in the internet governance sphere in general, one thing that has worked very well is movements towards interoperability. There's a lot of discussion about fragmentation of the internet, and I believe that that is a concern. But 
in my uh, career and lifetime, um, I spent my early career trying to make computers that were made by one company connect to computers that were made by another company. And it wasn't obvious how to do that. So if Maria and I um, you know, wanted to send email uh, quite a long time ago and she was on one platform and I was on another, we couldn't have done it. So I want to I want to remind everyone of that 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 is in one generation we have gone from not having the ability to communicate with each other if we use different companies to the ability to communicate over email over social media over Zoom over many different platforms the reason that that has happened is because of a very important area of internet governance and that is standard setting we have in general um, a, a trajectory over time of uh, protocols, uh, blueprints, technical standards that are can be called open and are accessible to use to develop products in order to ensure interoperability. So I would say that that's an area of internet governance that has gone very well. We have a common address space so that anyone around the world can plug into the global internet and use um, a unique internet protocol address, whether that is for a particular session or unique to the person. We have movements towards greater cybersecurity. And I think maybe one of the great stories of the internet and of internet governance is that we haven't had a major worldwide outage. We've had lots of outages, but we haven't had a catastrophic outage. And I think that that is a tremendous success story around internet governance. Thank you very much for that question. Perfeito. A pergunta havia sido feita por um engenheiro. É o well, that question has been addressed by an engineer, Mr. Moreiras. Is still along the same lines. Maybe both of you could help us adding some additional components. How could we think over about the internet protocol from a Chinese perspective? As Laura mentioned in her talk, what is your opinion? about the re-engineering of the internet protocol. This is a new movement, and Laura has written so much about internet protocol, and Marília also could share her opinion about that. And what does that mean to internet as a whole and to internet governance? Shall we start with Marília and then with Professor Laura, please? Once we talk about the Chinese participation, I never forget how much we celebrated when China resume uh, to be part of that uh, governor block. But let's emphasize that uh, China participation at different institutions, that is that should not be seen as a negative participation, participation but rather positive. To play the game as part of the system. Once China participates at any institution, at any game, at any institutions, they are participating. They uh, want to be influenced. They send uh, some players. And China is author of a uh, hundred of uh, proposals for ITU that's more than Japan, Korea together. Therefore, China is being uh, highly participative in developing standards and norms. That means that they are influencing some of the standards. Yes, because they want to privilege their own companies. If we consider some other countries and players from Western countries who, which also try to privilege their standards to empower their commercial positions based on some technologies that could uh, help them to improve their, compet their competitive levels. Well, they want to influence the game, uh, the game, but at the same time, they allow to be influenced by others. And now, 
they understand what is the position at the other side. Why are some standards being uh, uh, proposed by some uh, authors? So we have uh, more opening and we have a joint participation now that we have China as part of that group. There is, however, a very clear the vision from a political system value, which is quite clear. However, the dialogue between both sides, I do not see that as been impossible, but rather that should be promoted by both sides. And I, what I see in the international scenario is that for research projects, if China is part of those projects, that is predefined. They just want to identify issues and they want to influence the internet thanks to their participation. As a researcher and as an investigator, I see some calls for research with a predefined label for problems identification. Not to know if the problems exist, but rather to list what those problems are. And I see that as a negative statement. They see themselves in the leadership and they have such a huge volume of growth in such a speed and they play a game uh, that was created by mainly Western countries. So we have to find some ways to deal with the, the Chinese participation and not to close the dialogue channels with the like-minded countries that should be deleterious to the global relationship that we had constructed so far. Excellent. Uh, Laura? Great. Laura, please. The internet protocol has worked very, very well. It has been, um, you know, an innovation that has brought benefits to people all over the world. And it has um, evolved because many protocols around it have evolved to solve certain problems. Um, and I, I do want to recognize that there's a tremendous amount of concern about, um, as people would describe it, the Chinese trying to re reinvent the internet. That's the way, it, that's the concern that is being described. So this concern refers to an effort by uh, the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology and also the technology giant Huawei to vaguely propose a new internet protocol to replace the longstanding core architecture of the internet. So they, they submitted this proposal to the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, which, as you know, is a sub-agency of the United Nations, uh, really just to, to form a study group examining the future internet. Um, the proposal does not uh, contain anything concrete. In my opinion, it, there's, it's not trying to solve a problem that needs solving. Um, so that's a concern. Um, and it was met with alarm by uh, the Internet's technical community, by uh, governments all over the world, by people who are concerned about having a universal Internet, and by private industry. So uh, what this does, though, is it emphasizes a lot of what we've already spoken about. That's that um, there's politically charged concern about infrastructure. The technical infrastructure of the Internet is now a proxy for national interest, for foreign policy, and for power. And it also um, emphasizes the stakes of who is doing the decision making. So I think it's a very interesting case. Um, it's not surprising that the proposal has triggered polarization. Um, should we expect to see a fragmented system as a permanent feature of the international system? I think that's the real question here, and uh, it's an important one. Good. Thank you for reminding us uh, uh, how internet is becoming a proxy for politics, right? And then it gets uh, it, it easier to understand uh, this approach that some companies are using. And I like what uh, Marilia is saying. If it's politics and if it really matters, we'll have to be open and listen to it. And how this is going to be done by bringing opposing voices to it? Well, we have some lessons learned, right, from multi-stakeholder approaches. 
and inevitably will have to deal with the challenges. We are coming to the conclusion of our panel, but Diego Canabal has asked that, and he's going to be in the seminar in the coming days. I think to some extent, your question has been answered by Marilia and Laura when they talked about the forest for the trees so I'm going to ask you my last question and then you can answer it and also draw your closing remarks. My last question concerns participation. And as I said, when I opened a participation that really thinks about multiple uh, stakeholders. How can we think about the participation of indigenous people, about African descendants, uh, not only thinking about the forums of discussion, but thinking about all the different layers of internet uh, management that you mentioned, including infrastructure? I was very touched about what Marília said concerning artificial intelligence. Should we really give space for artificial intelligence as a topic to be addressed by internet governance? Whereas Laura said that internet has a number of users which are no longer human users, they are machine. So, so much to think about. Artificial intelligence is not outside, it's a user by itself. In Laura's book, she says that the machine learning process are just so automated that you don't even know where you are. There are some moments in which engineers cannot have the reverse engineering to get to know how they got that far. Therefore, the question is, how can we consider the next steps in terms of multi-stakeholder forums in diversity of gender, race, and others? And I would like to ask you to answer and then close your, uh, draw your closing remarks. Marília, thank you, Fernanda. Well, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. It's also so wonderful to exchange my opinions with you, Laura, and the Brazilian audience. In my recent research about internet governance, I have inferred some, some points. First of all, internet governance has to be introduced to people based on real life problems. It's no use getting to a community, an indigenous community, and talk high level how ICOM works and how domain names work. But bring it closer to something that applies to them would make people get more involved. You have given us a great example of how indigenous uh, population use technology during the pandemic. This is real life example. This is what's going to make a difference and make people get involved in the different discussions. Secondly, capacity building should be done closer to where people are. We have to have trained the trainers. We need those leaders from the communities where they work to act as multipliers of knowledge, of trainers about that, so that we can all speak the uh, common language of those communities so that they can really understand African continent, for example, their internet governance is provided just in English, very rarely in French. But over 50% of African countries speak local languages. So how can we reach them? By train the trainers and have people close to their communities address these issues. This is a challenge that we have really to embrace to be able to reach these communities. Thank you. Thank you, Marília. Wonderful participation. Thank you. Laura, please. Thank you for that question and thank you, Marília, for what you shared. Uh, what I would add to this is just a 
perspective that, and I, I want to remind people that some of the greatest thinkers and some of the greatest scholars and some people who are engaged in advocacy and policy making around internet governance are diverse. They're experts, they're leaders, uh, they're, they're women, people of different genders, they're people of color. And so just a reminder that, um, you know, there are a lot of voices that are represented in expert communities. So that is a good thing. But there are also many, many people who are not able to engage at all in uh, these different uh, foras. And, um, you know, that, that has been a problem for a long time. Um, I think that we've had improvements. I think we have to, you know, do better. Um, so it's not just a matter of getting involved in the different kinds of international discussions. It's also um, about specific issues that are designed and choices that are made inside of technology that affect indigenous people, that affect people of color, that affect uh, minorities, that affect marginalized people. So one of these areas is um, algorithmic bias, for example. One of these issues is facial recognition. One of these issues is how to incorporate different kinds of languages in the structures of internet governance. So there are many, and of course, improving access. So, you know, in addition to the global discussions where I think diversity is increasing slowly but surely, um, there are specific issues that exist that have to be addressed within the design. And then finally, I would say that all people are affected by many of the problems that exist. Um, so the human rights for all that exist um, in the internet governance uh, sphere, it's, it's, it's almost, a, there are some universal human problems, like the right to have some domain of privacy, the right to speak, but also the right to not be harassed online, the right to participate in the digital economy, and the right to um, be safe and to, to have um, some kind of personal and human security while participating in the cyber physical world. So with that in mind, I think I would close with, um, you know, what is one technical solution to a lot of the last problems that I mentioned um, is cyber, greater cybersecurity. So that's why I always say that's the great human rights issue of our time, because it's necessary for securing the economy. It's necessary for providing human rights. It's necessary for protecting people's privacy and uh, many other things. So uh, thank you very much, Fernanda, for letting me uh, participate in this. Marilia, thank you. It was a pleasure to join you. And thanks, everyone, for the great questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Um, eu tô muito, muito feliz com esse painel. Well, I'm just so glad with the panel. I've learned so much. I'm really full of energy after our discussion. I would like to thank Laura and uh, Marilia for your participation and for sharing your great knowledge with us. Today in the morning, a friend just uh, uh, wrote to me, said, well, I don't feel represented in the panel no, because there was no man. Because I keep on questioning him, you see? Because whenever we participate in panels, there are just men. So he just did it with good intention and jokingly. So what I think we need uh, to hear is more dissonating, disagreeing voices. And I think we still have got a lot to learn. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you to IGA. And I hope you have a great event and hope to see you in the internet shortly. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy.